Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I welcome, want to welcome you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, tonight, we're going to have what is surely going to be a lively and, and, and uh, interesting conversation with uh, Congressman Barney Frank. Uh, his title uh, is one of the best titles I've seen in quite a long time. The Emperor Has Too Many Clothes, uh, The Deficit, the Pentagon, and the Quality of Life in America. Uh, I, w I do want to thank uh, all the, the IOP and all the students and others that have made this possible this evening. Uh, it's uh, absolutely timely, and thanks to all your work. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to turn uh, the, the podium over to Jeff Solnit to introduce our guest. But I do want to mention one thing just in passing, uh, which is the rules of the road around here. As I think all of you know, the Kennedy School is, and the Harvard is very fortunate to have extraordinary people come and speak. Uh, for which we are incredibly grateful. And the rules of their speaking are only two. First is we, anyone who speaks here, must absolutely answer questions from the audience. And uh, Congressman Frank is quite willing um, and quite good uh, at answering questions, no matter what they are from the audience. In exchange, we expect that the speaker will be given an unfettered chance to complete uh, his or her talk uh, without interruption. And if someone chooses to violate those rules, uh, they will be asked to leave. You have plenty of opportunity to ask questions at the end. So I'm very much looking forward to this evening, but let me now introduce Jeff Solnit, who is the president of the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Committee, uh, and he'll be introducing Mr. Frank. He's a member of the Harvard College class of 2012. He's got spectacular talents. He's a government major as well as a secondary field in com uh, computer science. He's actually uh, in Mather House and hails from Boca Raton, Florida, um, the kind of weather we have here uh, this, today. But uh, more importantly, he is spectacular and successful and available for hire. And so uh, if you think he does a good job on this introduction, I would urge you to uh, think about what remarkable things he could do for you. So thanks very much, Jeff Solon. <laughs> Uh, it is with great honor that I can warmly welcome Representative Frank both back to Harvard and back to the IOP family this evening. While many know uh, that Representative Frank spent nearly a decade here at Harvard both as an undergraduate and graduate student, people often forget his role as student assistant to the first director of the Institute of Politics, Richard Neustad. For those that don't know, the Institute was designed as a living memorial to President Kennedy built on the idea that some moment, experience, or interaction sparked a young John F. Kennedy to enter political life. Mr. Neustad, commenting on the founding of the Institute, said, we started trying to excite people about elected politics at a time when there was already such excitement in the air. Congressman Frank's first days were no different. At the height of the Vietnam War, President Johnson's Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara, was not particularly popular on Harvard's campus. However, Representative Frank and Richard Neustad were determined to give students the opportunity to engage with Secretary McNamara, and they certainly took the opportunity up. Secretary McNamara was the first of the IOP's fellows, then called associates. At that time, the JFK Forum didn't exist, and there wasn't much precedence for how to expose students to someone like Secretary McNamara. In planning for his visit, Representative Frank helped establish many of the traditions that we continue here today, such as having off-the-record discussions with guests and randomly selecting interested students to join at various events. The future congressman held a public lottery where he selected, by pointing blindfolded at a large page, 120 students to attend a small discussion with the secretary. He even nimbly negotiated with progressive anti-war activists, Students for a Democratic Society, all in an effort to create a safe, peaceful space for his peers to engage in real discussion with the secretary. However, despite Frank's, uh, Representative Frank's best efforts, protesters crowded around Secretary McNamara's car, forcing him to stand on top and make further remarks. As the situation grew more heated, Congressman Frank led Secretary McNamara through the steam tunnels under, under Harvard's campus to safety. This early moment in the history of the Institute of Politics set the stage for our future. Congressman Frank's work has helped the IOP provide 45 years of political dialogue on this campus, engaging world leaders and politicians with some of the brightest minds in the country. But more importantly, Congressman Frank used the same skills practiced here at Harvard to build a long list of legislative accomplishments. Like his fellow Harvard students in the 1960s, Congressman Frank continues to speak frankly about his convictions and use facts to challenge his peers in the House of Representatives. 
Whether advocating for consumer rights or civil rights for his constituents in Massachusetts or for the country at large, there is no doubt that Representative Frank has learned much from his time, both as a student and a teacher here at Harvard. Congressman Frank Pierce wrote the following profile in the Harvard 1966 yearbook. With a New Jersey accent, the burly, bespeckled Barney Frank displays an immense knowledge of government, from the arid heights of political theory on down to the personal eccentricities of the Massachusetts State Legislature. He is a phenomena, a living demonstration that an education can be vital, vibrant, and fun, and notes that his integrity, irreverence, and energy command the respect of his students. I have no doubt, like that as undergraduate students nearly 44 years ago, we are to be captivated by not just the words, but also the example of Representative Frank this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, for historical purposes, where uh, we emerge from the steam tunnels, it's right across the street in the gulch there between Kirkland and Elliott houses. Uh, that was out of that door that we took Robert McNair and it hasn't been mentioned, I just really want to tell you that uh, whatever you think of his policies, etc., and he of course expressed later uh, some very poignant regrets, uh, he was an extraordinarily decent human being because uh, uh, my careful planning, <clears throat> he was at the time Member Secretary of Defense, it was just before the Congressional elections of 1966, <clears throat> and uh, I managed to thrust him into the uh, midst of an extremely embarrassing situation which became international news even. It was on North Vietnamese radio, so um, he, and he just was very gracious about it, so I've always appreciated that. Uh, what I am going to talk about today is the military budget, and to explain my title, um, I have for some time been frustrated because I believe we heavily overspend on the U.S. military to the detriment of our economy in many ways. And I have been frustrated by my inability to get people to understand that. The frustration grew until recently, because I think we're now getting some attention. But I would hear people debate the deficit. And they would talk, uh, Greg Mankiw, uh, uh, major uh, advisor to President Romney, uh, to, to candidate Romney, as he was to President Bush. Um, recently wrote in the New York Times on Sunday that we have to either raise taxes or cut Social Security and Medicare. And I get frustrated that this, I think, grossly overinflated military budget is left out. And it struck me, I, I said, I feel like the kid who said the emperor has no clothes because nobody else noticed. But it occurred to me that the problem is not that the emperor has no clothes, but that this emperor is wearing four sweaters, three suits, six hats, a lot of boots, and gives away clothes to everybody in the world. Um, my purpose is to say um, uh, it's the military budget stupid, to go back to that Clinton era with the economy. Um, my fundamental point is that we spend, by the way, we will be spending in this fiscal year more than $650 billion on the U.S. military, much more than Medicare, for example. Uh, the military budget not, is, uh, if you leave out the entitlements, you talk about the discretionary budget, the departments of health and human services and education and transportation, justice, et cetera, et cetera, <clears throat> and state, the military budget is more than half of that total. More than half of it is the, the military is 54 percent, the other is 46 percent. The amount is just staggering. Um, and in fact, we have two military budgets. We have the base budget, it's called, which is about $535 billion, which is the Pentagon. And then whenever we go to war, the Pentagon, to try to keep the number looking small, and the president, they're not autonomous, um, come up with a separate budget for the war. In fact, the way it works, for those of you who are familiar with the legal profession, it would appear that we have the military on retainer. That is, we pay them a certain amount every year, or we pay the budget every year, but if they go to war, they, they bill us. And um, so the total is $650 billion. $120 billion right now is for the war in Afghanistan. It would be maybe a little bit more, we'll probably save, we'll, we'll save a little bit when we pull out of Iraq. The point is that that amount far exceeds any rational assessment of our national security. And if you read it, um, uh, part of the problem is, and I had a high-ranking Pentagon guy, I can't quote him, 
take, told a friend, tell Frank he's right. The problem with the military, with our, us is, whenever we, we spend money to do something, and when there's no longer a need, that need, we keep spending. See, we never get out of anywhere. In 1949, Harry Truman did a great thing. Western and Central Europe was, were, was consisted of countries that were poor and weak, and they were threatened by a very aggressive communism and a brutal one under Stalin. <clears throat> now, they were poor and weak because of World War II. Russia was also poor, but it wasn't weak because Stalin could use that enormously repressive mechanism to put whatever nickel he did have into the military. And there was this serious threat of an advancing communism. England, Prime Minister Attlee called Truman in 47 and said, hey, look, I've been trying to keep the communists out of Greece. I can't handle it anymore. England doesn't have the money. You better come in. So that led to the establishment of NATO in 1949. That was a great thing. And here were the elements of NATO. Poor and weak, Western and Central Europe. Aggressive and threatening and heavily armed communism. And to keep them apart, billions and billions of American military dollars and manpower. Now, three of those elements were there in 49. Two of them have not have disappeared. Western and Central Europe, the countries are no longer poor and weak. There is no more Stalin, there's no more communism, there's no more Soviet Union. What hasn't changed is that we are still protecting the now wealthy nations of Western Europe against a non-existent threat. And I understand, there's still Russia. Russia is not comparable in its power to the Soviet Union. And I, I am no great fan of Russia. I am still grateful that my grandparents got the hell out of there. But <laughs> the, the, we are still armed. We have NATO. By the way, NATO was 61 years ago. Very few constructs of that sort really have a, a life of 61 years of a useful life. If you go back in time, by the way, before NATO, for the same amount of time since NATO, you are in the first presidency of Grover Cleveland. Uh, two things have survived. Uh, I mean, nothing has survived from the Cleveland administration. Uh, NATO survived 61 years. It's not just Western Europe. Right after World War II, we put Marines on Okinawa. They were there in part to reassure the rest of Asia that the Japanese would be not attacking again. We still have Marines in Okinawa. They have no military function. Yes, we have a problem with China. There is air and sea power. But 10,000 Marines in Okinawa have no role. We're not going to send 10,000 Marines to fight the Chinese millions. They are there because they're there. Well, wait, I'll tell you why they're there. And uh, I, I think the best thing to do is to, uh, is to quote people. This is from the New York Times about a week ago. Um, Defense officials say it would be catastrophic, further cuts in the military. It would force troop productions in the Pacific. Now, we have a, well over 100,000 people. We have the 7th Fleet. We have troops in South Korea. Um, they argue that even a small drawdown of, say, 5,000 troops would be seen in the region as a symbolic retreat as China expands its military capabilities. Now, too, China is expanding. Um, and every year, we, of course, spend far more than the Chinese spend in that year. And the Chinese, yes, they are expanding. In fact, they just are about to launch their first aircraft carrier. The first Chinese aircraft carrier is uh, a retrofitted ship that they bought from Ukraine. Um, I'm sure that looks pretty impressive to the Vietnamese. I'm not afraid of it, to be honest, and uh, I'm not playing tough guy. Um, so we have the troops in Japan. We have uh, a nuclear arsenal. We were ready to fight a thermonuclear war against the Soviet Union. And we had the triad. The triad is uh, three ways of dropping thermonuclear weapons on the Soviet Union. Strategic Air Command, nuclear submarines, and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Not coincidentally, and this is part of our problem, that's one for each service. The Army has the missiles, and the Navy has the submarines, and the Air Force has the uh, airplanes, of course. There is no more Soviet Union to fight. I have a serious suggestion. People think I'm kidding. I want to say it depending on, you know those three ways we have to win a thermonuclear war against the Soviet Union? Pick two. Give up one. You pick the one. It would probably be missiles. The others have dual use. We'd save billions of dollars. Um, the, the point is that there is this view that we have to be everywhere. Um, and I, as I said, I think it is very clear. We are 
overcommitted militarily. Go back to Western Europe. The average percentage of gross domestic product spent by the Europeans on their military is 1.7 percent. We're more than three times that. Um, why, why should the U.S. be spending money to keep troops in Germany when the Germans don't feel all that worried about it? Um, further examples, the Air Force, strongest Air Force in the world, fortunately, is the U.S. Air Force. I want us to be the strongest nation in the world. You know what the second strongest Air Force in the world is? It's the U.S. Navy. Now, <laughs> I don't want to tempt fate, but if the Air Force was the strongest Air Force in the world and the Navy was tied for third, I would feel very secure. I don't think we have to have first and second place all to ourselves. And it is based on, I'm trying to find the particular quote, um, where they say, um, President Obama, this is from November 3rd of this year, quoting the uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, President Obama's national security strategy calls on U.S. forces to be able to strike virtually any target on the planet. That's very expensive. And it is, you cannot tell me that our national security depends on being able to shoot anybody, anywhere, anytime. Um, and we take it on now, in fact, when you ask people, they, the defenders of this, they go beyond uh, national security. Um, here's uh, William Crystal. Um, I guess there's uh, bills around here these days. In his article, National Interest and Global Responsibility, and here is the explanation why we, uh, why we need to do this. And it's based, frankly, on the notion that simply, here we go, At the beginning of this century, Theodore Roosevelt worried, this is his rationale that he says is good, Theodore Roosevelt had it right. Theodore Roosevelt worried that Americans had become so isolated from the struggles of the rest of the world and so immersed in our material prosperity, think of that, we're worried about having a decent living here at home, that they were becoming a feat. Roosevelt implored Americans to look beyond the immediate needs of their daily lives and embrace as a nation a higher purpose in the world. He inspired a greatness for America. He believed the nation could only be great if it accepted its responsibilities to advance civilization and improve the world's condition. Um, this is, in, in many cases, and people will be explicit about this, I'm on the Republican side, it is American exceptionalism that God created America. I didn't make this up. God created America to be the leader in the world and to, and, and to be the enforcer of order in the world. Having heard that a couple of times, I decided that I am entitled to a refund on my Bible. <laughs> because I do not remember in the version of Genesis I bought that God created NATO. I mean, he created na night and day and uh, water and earth. I mean, but it, it, they explicitly, in fact, demean the notion that uh, our purpose should be to uh, improve ourselves. So here's where we, uh, here's again Mr. Crystal. Um, American preeminence cannot be maintained from a distance by some post-Cold War version of the Nixon Doctrine where we hang back and keep our powders dry. We would instead conceive ourselves, this is if we did what they think is necessary, and which they're trying to get the budget to do, and which the budget under George Bush became that. The United States would conceive of itself as at once a European power, an Asian power, a Middle Eastern power, and of course a Western Hemisphere power. It would act as if threats to the interests of our allies and threats to us, which they are. It would act as if instability in important regions of the world, by the way, when people in this geopolitical thing start talking about important regions of the world, you will not be surprised to know that there are no unimportant regions of the world. Every region of the world is either important in itself or it's important because it is next to an important region of the world. So there, that's why we have to hit every target everywhere. And again, I'm not making this up. This is, uh, this is what they say. Um, it would act as if it's and the flouting, it would act as if in stability in important regions of the world and the flouting of civil, civilized rules of conduct in those regions are threats that affect us with almost the same immediacy as if they were occurring on our doorstep. Otherwise, we would be an unreliable partner in world affairs which would erode American preeminence and the international order. 
um, it is this notion again that, that we need to take it on ourselves to do all these things. And the last one um, from Jeff Jacoby, who's the leading conservative writer of the Boston Globe, quoting John Adams, who didn't understand that we had to run the world. And he said, in Adams' day, America was not the mightiest, wealthiest, and most influential nation on the face of the earth. Today it is. The United States is the world's only superpower, and if we shirk the role of global policemen, no one else will fill it. Right, because they're too smart to become, try to be the global uh, uh, superpower. Uh, with great power comes great responsibilities. One of these destroy monsters, take down tyrants, and flout the rules of civilization. If neighborhoods and cities need policing, it stands to reason the world does too. Totally false analogy. Your neighborhood or city is police, but they vote for the police, they pay for that police. Now, I would be morally conflicted if I thought we could do it. That is, here I am saying, you know, let's not try. But in fact, the notion that heavily armed, very brave young Americans can put down instability, can bring civility to foreign cultures. Uh, we just had this argument with some of the administration who want us to stay in Iraq. Why? Because the Kurds don't get along with the Arabs and the Shia don't get along with the Sunni. And that is obviously true, and I regret that. But I don't think sending the American military is going to stop that. I mean, the fact is that these efforts, here's the deal. The, mil the American military is a superb force, and they can stop bad things from happening. The problem is these people think you can use the military to make good things happen. And you can't, and it does more harm than good. So I have been arguing that. Now, that gets greater force today because if we do not reduce the military, we're going to cut entitlements, i.e. Social Security and Medicare. Or we're going to raise taxes. I just quoted Mr. Mankiw, who says, well, the choice is raising taxes or cutting the military, uh, cutting the entitlements. There's a great quote, I can't find it, from Buck McKeon, who is the Republican chair of the Committee uh, on Armed Services in the House. And he said that coming after the Pentagon because they want to protect the sacred cows of entitlement spending. I would tell you that I think that the enactment in the United States in the 20th century of Social Security and Medicare were two great social accomplishments. Prior to that, the notion of a middle class existence when you got old was a rarity. If you weren't rich and you lived long enough, you got poor. And with the combination of those two, we created the norm of a middle class existence, not a luxurious one. I don't understand why I would apologize for that. By the way, in Italy, they're now talking about changing the retirement age from 60, uh, to bring it up to 60. It is, of course, in America, 65. Now, how can the Italians do it? They've got some problems now, but why have they been able to afford that retirement age? Because they don't have to have any military budget. We have, we have subsidized this. Um, it is now either or. It's a zero-sum game. I, I don't want to make cuts immediately, and I think we should be putting some money into the economy, but yes, we do have to adopt a long-range deficit reduction plan. If you do not cut the military substantially, and by the way, we're at 650, I'm talking about ending the war in Afghanistan and cutting another 100. It would leave us at $450 billion, still more than the next five nations in the world put together, and of course, about three of those five nations are our allies. So our margin of superiority at 450 billion would still be enormous. It would bring us back more to where we were under the Clinton administration. We face a choice. If we exempt the military from budget cutting, then Social Security and Medicare get hit very badly. Um, so what are the arguments against reducing the military? Well, one, of course, is this argument that uh, we have to fulfill the great purpose. They do make an effort to say, oh, if you reduce the military, we will be weak. That's based on cultural lag. Before 1940, America didn't have much of a military because we didn't need one. I mean, the only people who Americans shot in any great number after the revolution, sadly, were each other uh, in the Civil War. Uh, we had big oceans and we were, there was no way to get at us. Then came the Nazis, and for 50 years, first under Hitler and then under the communists, it is true, there were evil forces in the world that threatened our existence as a free nation and had the capacity to damage us. And that was over, I think it was overstated towards the end of the Cold War, but at any rate, that collapsed in 1990. Since 1991, there has been no existential threat to America's existence, and we have built up a sufficient military capacity that it's hard to envision one. Given that, Bill Clinton, first President Bush Sr. and Bill Clinton began to bring down the military. One reason that Bill Clinton was able to balance the budget in 2000 is that he brought down military spending. 
He also raised taxes on the rich and did put some limits on uh, domestic spending, some which I didn't like. But a reduction in military spending was an important part of that. Now, what we hear from the defenders of the unlimited Pentagon spending is that this is a bad idea. And in fact, they say, if we, if we do this, we're going to hollow out the military. And Leon Panetta, or at least, well, the man who identified as Leon Panetta, having known Panetta when he was in the House, I suspected something happened in the CIA, and I haven't seen the DNA. But at any rate, <laughs> the, the, the person known as Leon Panetta says, we must not make any further cuts in the military. Remember, 5,000 less troops out of 100,000 in Asia, and, and it would sink morale. We got hit every corner of the globe. He said, we must not again make the mistake that we made of hollowing out the military. And he said, um, we made that mistake after World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Cold War. This is uh, Leon Panetta from October. We cannot afford to repeat the mistakes of past reductions in force that followed World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the fall of the Iron Curtain which to varying degrees, as a result of across-the-board cuts, weakened our military. We must avoid a hollow military. Note that Mr. Panetta says that we hollowed out the military after the Cold War. A little history quiz. Who was the President of the United States after the Cold War? It was Bill Clinton. Who was Bill Clinton's budget director? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Leon Panetta. Leon Panetta, and then he went on to be the Chief of Staff. It is extraordinary. He, 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 the, the, the mind games that are going on here, he has now announced, and by the way, when he was budget director and chief of staff, he boasted that they were able to, uh, correctly, that they were able to balance the budget. He's now retroactively telling us that he balanced the budget by hollowing out the military. By the way, the argument that he hollowed out the military is nonsense. I was talking to Gordon Adams, who I'll be doing a repeat of this at the Council on Foreign Relations Monday, who was his deputy at the OMB for Defense, and I've asked them this question, these, oh, you've hollowed out the military. Can anybody think of any instance in the last 20 years, I'd say 30 years, I certainly cannot, nobody I know can point to one, where America had an objective it wanted to accomplish with military force and we were too weak to do it? I can think of no case where we did not have the military force to do what we did. By the way, this hollowed out military was very successful in uh, bombing Milosevic into submission, so we got uh, some good results in, 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 in uh, Croatia. And then this hollowed out military, after George Bush becomes president, he didn't have that much time to, I don't know how you unhollow something, stuff it again. Um, but he fought, to, he went into two wars. I mean, this notion that the military was hollowed out is nonsense. I had one of the leading Republicans, we had an angry debate, and he said, no, there you go again, you're trying to cut the military. And I remember in the 90s when we had hangar queens. And uh, what were hangar queens? Well, they were these airplanes we had, these expensive airplanes, that stayed in the hangar because we didn't have enough pilots to fly them. And he wouldn't yield to me. And I wanted to say, well, I have to say to my friend, yes, I understand these airplanes were in the hangars, but it wasn't because we had too few pilots. It was because we had too many airplanes. And nobody can show me where there was a need to bomb somebody that we weren't able to bomb. That was during the time when we had total air superiority in Yugoslavia. So the argument, one, it's, what we have, I think, and why it succeeded is, well, the other argument is it's, it's the terrorists. Yes, the communists are gone, we have the terrorists. Terrorists, vicious, evil people. I am in favor of the drones. I would like to see them killed. You know, Osama bin Laden, not only did he kill thousands of Americans, but because he's mad at America, with an angry at Israel on the side, he slaughters hundreds of innocent Africans in Kenya and Tanzania by blowing up our embassy. This man was a mad dog. Of course he had to be dealt with. But the terrorists are greatly flattered to cons compare them in destructive capacity, either Hitler or the Soviet Union. They don't have nuclear weapons, they don't have, uh, and, and delivery systems, they don't have tanks, they don't have planes. Yes, we need to fight them. Fighting the terrorists is a lot less expensive. It's harder in some ways. I wish you could defeat terrorism with nuclear submarines, because we have them, they don't, be over. But you, we, 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 troops in Germany do nothing to fight terrorism. Thermonuclear weapons to destroy the Soviet Union do nothing to fight terrorism. So let me get back to one last argument, and I'm going to throw this open, uh, which is the most astounding at all. Oh, by the way, here's my, I found a quote from Buck McKeon. Defense has contributed more than half of the de deficit reduction measures taken to date. Yes, from the part of the budget where defense is more than half the budget. So, some, quote, want to use the military to pay for the rest. 
to protect the sacred cow that is entitlement spending. That's the uh, position. And then Robert Samuelson, a former Crimson editor, who covered that McNamara story, by the way, um, has an article in the Washington Post supporting the military budget and objecting to quotes, and the headline is, the Pentagon versus the welfare state. I mean, that's why I said, let me just say, and I'll get on to the next, the last point and throw it open. We need to reduce the deficit, not in the near term. We should be spending some more. By the way, in terms of what, what, what the government's done, and every month, I think in the last 15, private sector jobs have gone up and public sector jobs have gone down. So we've had a net increase, much smaller than we wanted, but it was offset, it would be a bigger. There are nearly a million fewer state and local employees today than there were when President Obama took office over our objections. The, the unemployment rate would be a couple of tenths of percent lower and these people would be out there working. Um, so we should not be doing that in the near term. But yes, we need a long-term deficit reduction. The point is very simple. If you exempt the military from deficit reduction, it is impossible to reduce the deficit and still have any serious effort to maintain the quality of life in America. The numbers just don't work. Um, and take, think of anything we now do, environmental protection, rail transit, health care for the very poor, et cetera. All of those we would have to do less of, not more of. Education, community colleges, student assistance. They all go down because the military budget is so huge. It is larger than Medicare. And I believe you can, it is one place where we can make substantial cuts and have no loss. But here's the final argument, which is really astounding. It is equivalent in, uh, I think, inconsistency to Panetta now confessing that he hollowed out the military when he wasn't looking. Um, it is that we cannot afford to cut the military because it will have a negative effect on jobs. The military, they say, creates jobs. Now understand that this comes, you may have seen Paul Krugman's column about this a week ago. This argument comes on the whole from people who say government spending can't create jobs. That the stimulus didn't create jobs, that government highway spending doesn't create jobs, that hiring teachers and cops doesn't create jobs. I call it weaponized Keynesianism. The argument is that no government spending creates jobs unless it's for the military. As a matter of fact, if, if you're spending versus not spending, yes. If the question is do you cut the military or not, that would have some near-term job reduction. But the issue is now, it's not whether you cut the military or not. Do you cut the military or do you cut something else? There have been articles in the Boston Globe about how bad this would be for Massachusetts. But if you don't cut the military and you cut medical care in Massachusetts, it will be much worse. We are a major, we make a lot of money off medical care, including I was at uh, one of the major hospitals in Boston earlier this week. And uh, one of the, uh, we were talking about what medical care does in Massachusetts. And they said, yeah, we have a patient now whose family is occupying from the Middle East the top four of the four seasons because that person is getting medical care in Boston. So I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars they'll be dropping here in, in those bills. We make medical instruments. We have uh, NIH research. We have biotech. So e even if you look at the job thing, we get hurt worse. In fact, military spending is one of the least efficient ways to do jobs. That's not a reason not to do it. You do military spending not as a big public works project, but to defend yourself. And you, you, well, we have allies that need help. I, South Korea, Taiwan, Israel, I, but not every target everywhere all over the globe. And again, the purpose is to protect them against bad things, not to go into chaos and, 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 and be alchemists and, and, and turn it into gold. But um, uh, there are two reasons why military spending is not so good for jobs compared to other things. I would say compared to other things, I would just be a little, a lesson. I, one of the things I have come more and more to rely on in my public sector work is a uh, piece of wisdom imparted in a kind of allegorical way by one of the great philosophers of the 20th century. His name was Henny Youngman. <laughs> and, um, Younger people can go look him up, but he was a very funny <laughs> comedian. Back in the era, in the 50s and 60s, when mother-in-law jokes and wife jokes were the staple of, uh, of humor. And, but he had one that was a, kind of a, a wife joke, but it was really very funny. How's your wife compared to what? Uh, really quite intelligent. Um, his answer, how's your wife is compared to what? Well, that, every question I ask, I gotta, I'm asked, I've got to say, compared to what? So cutting military spending compared to cutting any other kind of spending will give you less jobs. First of all, 
except for the foreign aid budget, which is 5% of the military budget, 4%, more of the military budget is spent, obviously, overseas than anywhere else. Secondly, it tends to be very capital intensive. Oh, and there's a third point. When we build a bridge or do health research or do all these other things, we are doing things that enhance the productive steam, stream. When we build a nuclear weapon, we build it and hope to hell it's never used. I mean, it's not the military's fault. Much of what we do in the military, we build never to use it. So it does not have the kind of uh, uh, knock-on positive effects. So that's where we are. Um, we, we, I believe, and again, the, it, it comes down to two arguments why we're doing this. One, because we're, we're getting unduly frightened by terrorism. Not that they're not vicious people. They're not the threat to us, and you fight them in different ways. By the way, much of the anti-terrorism stuff isn't even in the military budget. It's in the Homeland Security budget. So I'm talking about cutting the military budget. That's got, very, it's got nothing to do with, with trying to what, do what we do at home. Um, and the other is, it's, it, how can you be a great nation if all you do is worry about how well you live and how good your kids feel and education? It's, a, it's, a, it's an assertion that worrying about the quality of your lives is unworthy of a great nation. There was a debate in the 19th century about that with the role of Great Britain, with people who were the anti-imperialists, and it was Great Britain versus Little England. Little England was a derogatory term for people who just want to live good lives. Well, I'm in the Little England, Little America thing, um, and, and that's where we are. So that's the issue. Um, and it will be coming up a uh, brief scenario. I don't think the 12-member uh, committee is going to be able to come to an agreement. We had thought, or some, because I voted against the bill, but some Democrats thought, oh, well, they'll be so afraid of what the sequester will do to military spending that they'll maybe go for raising taxes, et cetera. No, I think what the Republicans plan to do is to, after the committee isn't able to come up with something, it's not that they don't want the committee to come up with something. If the committee would have cut Medicare, Social Security, et cetera, they'd be very happy with it. Um, but they believe that next year they can amend the sequester to exempt the military. So I think sometime next year we're going to have this fight, because if you exempt the military from these cuts, you do it in one of two ways. Either you reduce the amount of deficit reduction that you get, or you really cut Medicare badly. And of course, they would like to abolish Medicare, although I will close with this. I, I apologize to Congressman Ryan, my colleague, for saying that he had a plan to abolish Medicare. That's the one that says, if you're under 55, you will not get Medicare when you hit the age of Medicare at 65. You know, if you're now under 55, when you reach 65, you won't get Medicare. You will get a, uh, a voucher from the government, which you can use to pay for private insurance, which will almost certainly be much more than that. Uh, but it's unfair to say that they're abolishing Medicare, because if you were now 40 years old, when you become 65, you will not get Medicare, but you will until then pay the Medicare tax. It's really quite interesting. They leave in place the Medicare tax. So if you're under 55, they continue to tax you. By the way, if they didn't do that, they wouldn't save any money. If you remitted the tax on the program, there'd be no savings. So they charge you the full tax and don't give you the benefit. Um, I would rather cut the military. With that, uh, I'm ready to talk Thank to people. Much. Thank you, Congressman. We have time for questions. Uh, as uh, most of you know, there are microphones in four different locations. If you'd like to ask a question, line up in front of the microphones. Um, uh, and I just want to rem remind you that a uh, good question at the Kennedy School has three elements. First, you identify yourself. Second, you keep the question short and with one uh, element. Uh, and finally, it ends with a question mark. And with that, I would like to start right over here. Hello, um, my name is Sarah and I'm a freshman at the college. And I was wondering, um, certain American politicians expressed some opposition to President Obama's pledge to get all American troops out of Iraq by the end of the year. But given our enormous troop levels in areas like, say, Germany or South Korea, I'm wondering if you think there's a certain amount of cognitive dissonance about saying that it would be terrible if we pulled out all of those troops, but we're going to keep a tremendous number of troops in areas where there seems to be no justification for well, it. Well, I, I, look, I think the president is mistaken in continuing uh, beyond this. I give Bill Clinton credit because he resisted this notion to spend more and more on the military. By the way, so did Bush Sr. Um, as to the criticism for pulling out of Iraq, I, I just, it, well, I think it helps refute the argument for more military spending. 
First of all, understand this is George Bush's timetable. And the Obama administration, I believe, Panetta was trying to stay in. From the conversations I had, I give Vice President Biden the credit. He was the one who most insisted, and we had this semi-public debate in the Democratic caucus. But the argument is, no one is arguing that after we pull out of Iraq, it will be in any way a threat to America. You know, even Dick Cheney has given up on weapons of mass destruction. Um, <laughs> what they say is, we must protect the gains that we have made in bringing stability to Iraq. By the way, it, it, this is some stability over there. But um, the argument is that American troops are necessary to preserve the social peace. That doesn't work. You cannot, again, you can stop people from shooting each other. You can't make them love each other by American troops. And the, 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 but the, the justification for us staying in Iraq has nothing to do with American security. It is all about our civilizing mission to the Iraqis. Now, I think the president's right about this. I wish he would go further and realize this. I don't know if you saw this, but I have a new hero, a man named Peter Fuller. He's a general. Um, and he just blew the whistle on the Afghans. He just got fired. He was the uh, lieutenant general in charge of American training of Afghans, and he said, this is a disgrace, this is a disaster, they don't want to do anything, they don't like us, we're wasting our money here. So they fired him, instead of saying, yeah, you're right, let's go home. So I agree that it, it is, I hope that the Iraq thing is the beginning. Right up here. Hi, I'm Lena Robinson of LPAC TV. Um, in my view, the most important thing that's facing us right now is the threat of an escalation into general warfare which would be triggered by an attack on Iran, if there were such a thing. And we have an escalation of the drum beats, which should remind people of how we got into Iraq in the first place, which was based on lies. And now the same scenario is being played up around Iran. Now an attack on Iran would immediately draw in Russia, China, United States, and nuclear weapons, possibly on American soil. So. My question, I mean, we have a buildup, it's true, we have like probably 150,000 troops the in the question, area. The question? My question is, when in the 1970s... What TV were you with? LPAC TV. LPAC? What is that? LaRouche PAC TV. LaRouchePAC.com. Okay, I thought so. Please hear me out. I have I, a question. Please get to your question and I'll yeah. be able to respond. My question is, in the 70s, the Republican... No, that's, that's, in the 70s, How it's not much a more is it going to take before the Democratic Party realizes that they have to move to impeach and remove President Barack Obama okay, thank you. First before of all, we get a no, world war going. I, I, thank you. You have just heard from the Lyndon LaRouche lunatic fringe of America. <laughs> and I am always pleased when the LaRouche people are here because I can demonstrate my deep commitment to the First Amendment, which is your right to say wacky things. Um, First of all, I do not want to see an attack. I'm sorry, ma'am, you asked your question. It's now my turn. You're going to have to abide by the rules. Uh, the fact is that I... Well, you call for the impeachment of Obama and... I'm sorry, you, I'll give you another minute and then I'm going to talk. Is that okay? My question is, how much more than a threat of general warfare is it going to take before the Democratic Party remove Obama like the Republicans removed Nixon when they realized that Obama is actually the one destroying the Democratic okay, Party. Okay, let me, all right, now, I want to respond now. First of all, I do not think it would be a good idea to bomb Iran, but I do not think there is a remotest chance that it would draw China and Russia into a war. Uh, that would not be happening. As a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, other people have bombed other people. So Russia and China are not going to go to war with the United States over Iran. Uh, I do worry about Iran having nuclear weapons and I want to step up the sanctions. I think our ultimate defense there is the same kind of deterrent we used against a much more heavily on Soviet Union, which is both Iran and North Korea should understand that they will be uh, destroyed if they attack us. I'm sorry you think it's slander, but I think the notion that we should impeach Barack Obama because you don't like his Iranian policy is lunatic. Um, and I'm sorry, ma'am, I, no, I don't think you get a third shot. And I've listened to what you had to say. Uh, th these are the people who, I mean, the last time I had LaRouche people talking about Obama, they were comparing him to Hitler. Um, yeah, you just nodded. You, you, okay. Uh, that, thank you. Um, uh, let me just say, I guess we should be uh, trying very hard to keep Iran from getting nuclear weapons. I think the ultimate threat is that they, the part of the problem with trying to bomb their facilities is at this point, those facilities are probably not easily bombable, et cetera. 
but no, there was no chance of a general war. And no, um, if you ask me how long is it going to take the Democrats uh, to impeach Obama, um, uh, I do not think we will ever. Let me answer your question specifically. Uh, never. Right here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark. I'm an MPP1 here at the Kennedy School. Um, there's a, a wide variety of programs here at the Kennedy School to work on nonprofits, um, to work in local governments, and to some degree it sometimes feels to me that there's a feeling that the federal government is a place of great frustration. And today in your talk you talked about uh, the various forces that have kind of been at war with each other and the things that they've said. Um, what, what do you think we should think about as students about our role in the federal government in the future? Is it something It depends on who controls it. I think for much of our history, serving in the federal government has been a very good way to do good things. But elections have consequences. The American people gave majorities, those who voted, in 2010 to people who do not believe that there is a constructive role for government. When the government is controlled by people who do not think it has a constructive role, there's not a lot you can do that would be constructive. Uh, a great deal depends on the outcome of the 2012 election. If you get a repeat of the last election and those people who are now in power in the House and grew their power in the Senate are in charge, know then the federal government would not be a great place to do a lot of useful things. And, uh, but it's, up, it's in the hands of the voters. And uh, that's, that's the answer. Right now, uh, there are still things going on and there are people in the federal government doing excellent work and very satisfying work. But if the Republicans win in the presidency, the House, and the Senate, they have a very different conception. They do not see a positive role for the federal government. Interestingly, it's too. they underplay the role of what we can do domestically. Many of them will overdo it internationally. They, they, they have a very activist role about what you can do to fix a society uh, overseas. But uh, if they win the election, there will be a diminution of the opportunity to do useful things at the uh, federal level. And by the way, at the state and local level as well, because if they control the federal government, funds to state and local government will dry up, and it will be, they, they will be reduced, and it will be harder to do constructive things there as well. Right over here. Um, I'm Andrew Mack. I'm a student at the college. And I was wondering about a statement you made about um, reducing military spending by $200 billion. You said $100 million of it would come from uh, a drawdown in Iraq and Afghanistan. $120. You said you also wanted to see $100 million more. Right. I'm wondering how long you think it would take to start saving the $120 million in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, and what specifically you would cut to get $100 billion. Right, yes. I think you could probably get, if you started now, you could be out of Afghanistan uh, by the end of next year. The plan now is to stay for 2014, so that would save a total of about 240. You can't just pull out. You have to uh, phase it. But all, on the other hand, you phase it down, so you, you begin to get those savings. First of all, I would withdraw American ground troops from Western, from Western Europe. Uh, I would withdraw. And, and what happens, is it's not just withdrawing the troops, so it's somewhat cheaper to bring them home. But we do not need as many members of the military as we now have. It's not a one-for-one -one reduction. Uh, the, the military refers to it as end strength. I believe you could substantially reduce the end strength of the military. I would reduce the stockpile of nuclear weapons. The New York Times had a very good um, uh, list of ways to save on October 30th. I would uh, uh, recommend it on uh, uh, how you could reduce the stockpile of nuclear weapons. You don't need to guard them, but you also don't need to produce more. I would pull the troops out of Okinawa. I would actually uh, reduce one of the three legs of the triad and I would cut back on the uh, acquisition of uh, strategic weapons. The other thing is I would have the Pentagon be more efficient. And there is an acknowledged inefficiency, but here's the problem. You cannot simply make people from the outside be more efficient. You cannot micromanage a complex organization. The only way to increase efficiency with any organization of that complexity, in my judgment, is to put some limit on what they spend. Once they limit, I guarantee you, if they knew that the money was tighter, they could be much tougher on the contractors, etc. So it would be a reduction in end strength, pulling back from much of the world, um, and uh, uh, I think you, you could reduce... Look, I think Libya was a good example of how we could get our NATO allies to do more, although they were sort of underprepared, and, and we had to help them a little bit. 
but uh, it's reducing the nuclear stockpile, reduce, getting rid of one of the three delivery systems, cutting back on the increase. I don't think we need as many nuclear submarines uh, or as many aircraft carriers. Again, if you look at the dominance we have over the rest of the world, um, and reducing the end strength. That would be the, uh, the major ways. I would not cut compensation to the military. Now, as to reducing the end strength, by the way, you're not firing anybody in the military. That would be outrageous if these people volunteered. But the average enlistment, I'm told, is about six years. So you can attrit down in the military very, fairly quickly. You know, uh, in two years, one third are up, and you don't, you don't have to replace them all. Right over here. Thank you. Uh, Robert Chu. Um, um, I assume you know President Obama very well and uh, his thinking, and how could you get him on board to, with your plans and thinking such that, and, and build a program to bring the budget uh, deficit down and also have a, a program to win the election. Well, next I'm year. trying. I, I wish I would more look at something. I understand the enormous weight on your shoulders when you are told every day in many languages that you were the leader of the free world. You know, uh, I was told by a high ranking Obama official when I said we should pull out of Iraq, no, no, the, the, the Iraqis want us to stay. Well, who the hell wouldn't want Americans to stay for nothing? Um, yeah, I mean, if some cop offered to sit in your backyard all night, well, you for nothing, you'd say, hey, good luck to have you, pal. Um, I mean, that, that's, uh, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's still a fight for his soul. I am convinced he would not go on with altering the sequester. And it's by making arguments. I, 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 uh, I hope we, we are trying to, 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 to persuade him. Um, it's an area where I am a little disappointed in him because I think he has not done as much as he could there. Um, there has been this historic tradition of Democratic presidents being afraid and candidates that they'll appear soft on national security. That's why our extremely able former governor wound up in a tank. Michael DeGorgas is a first-rate guy, and he shouldn't have been in the tank. But I understand. They said, oh, you're a liberal. You've got to show you're ready to shoot people. So he, who had been in the military and had a better military service, um, he was in the tank and he lost. I mean, that, was, uh, that, that contributed to his defeat, sadly, and it was a great loss for the country. Um, so you, we just got to keep uh, banging away at it with regard to the uh, president, and people need to speak out and support him. Now, one of the things that's going to help with him is the fact is that under Obama's leadership, um, Gaddafi, bin Laden, and Owaki were all killed by Americans. Well, not by Americans, the Libyans killed, obviously, Gaddafi. Um, I would hope he would feel insulated from the charge that he's too soft to be able to do that. Right up here. I'm sorry, are you looking up here? I can't see yes. very well. Yes, he is. Uh, my name is Michael Brower. I, uh, I got a master's and a PhD from Harvard. I studied at this school before Kennedy became president, and it was called the Litauer School. Uh, Congressman, I'd call you Barney if we went back 40 years, <laughs> early years in politics. I, um, question is, um, why don't you include in your speech the warning of President Dwight David Eisenhower in his farewell address to the American people? As you and I know, people in the audience probably don't, he was a five-star general, general of the army, commander-in-chief of all allied forces in Europe uh, fighting World War II, went on to be elected president, and in his farewell address to the American people, he warned us of the military-industrial complex. Why don't you quote him? Well, Why two reasons. You? First of all, I get a little, a little nervous because I, I, when I have someone I don't agree with all the time, I, I, I get a little nervous. But I, I, it's a valid point to make, but I would say this. In my analysis, I think the reason for the high level of spending is less the military industrial complex, meaning the people who make money by selling weapons, and that was the, the influence, and more the kind of cultural lag in the view. I, 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 there's some of it about weapons, but it's more the greatness of purpose and even more, oh, my God, America's threatened. It is this perception that uh, there were these, uh, there, were, there were crocodiles out there, there, there be dragons. Uh, so that's my analysis of it. But, I, but you're right, that is something that I, I should have mentioned as, as one of the things that Dwight Eisenhower did predict. And as a matter of fact, ironically, 
as Michael remembers from our ADA days, um, one of the issues that John Kennedy used against Richard Nixon was that the Eisenhower administration was soft on defense. It was the missile gap. John Kennedy accused the uh, Eisenhower administration of allowing a missile gap to appear between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in which we were on the short end. Now that got some currency because, think about it, the Soviets were the first into space. The Soviets got into space in 58 before we did. So it was plausible that they had this um, thing. So it is in fact the case that they, they use that against Eisenhower and you're right. Right up here. Hi, my name is Salman Hussein. I'm at the Kennedy School. Uh, I'm curious, Congressman, uh, listening to you talking about basically limiting military spending, I wanted to hear your take essentially on whether you think that President Obama should take a harder stance uh, regarding Israel and President Netanyahu uh, essentially who's basically uh, continuing settlement building even though earlier in his administration the Obama administration was really against it. I wanted to know if you think that either A, Obama should take a harder stance against Netanyahu in this case, or B, also cut back or entirely uh, end funding to Israel regarding military expenditures. Well, first of all, I mean, I, it's a perfectly reasonable question, but it has nothing to do with cutting military spending. It's totally unrelated. That's fine. But you said given that well, I, I mean, because a lot of the foreign aid that America gives around the world, the vast majority of it goes to Israel, and the vast majority of that well, aid no, is the majority military, does not military go to Israel. The majority, Israel gets more than any other country, but it's not a majority of what we, of what we give. Right. And by the way, we have a, another recipient that is closing in on Israel, uh, to my dismay, which is Pakistan, which um, why we pay them to hate us is a, a separate sort of psychological question. But um, um, it is true that the two largest recipients of American foreign aid are both Israel and Egypt. Egypt, not quite as much. And it, one reason is, and I support this no matter what else you think, that was a promise America made over at Camp David. And President Carter said at the time, if you guys make peace, I will basically, you, I'll pay you forever. And I think with all of the ups and downs, that Israeli-Egyptian peace is one of the few bright things we've seen. And I, I notice that it does appear to be surviving um, the Egyptian uh, overthrow of Mubarak. There was a fear that it wouldn't. As to the settlements, yes, I think we should make clear our opposition to the settlements. I am opposed to them. But I would not, I oppose the policies of a lot of countries. I think India is continuing to violate the UN mandate in Kashmir. I think India treats the Kashmiris who don't want to be part of India badly. And we should put pressure on them. But I don't want to cut off uh, relations with India. Um, I think the fundamental dispute between, I noticed that President Abbas just said, that he acknowledges that the Arabs made a mistake when they opposed partition in 1948 and tried instead to wipe out Israel. A lot of this happened since then. Yes, I think that, I, I, but if I was an Israeli, I'd be even more strongly opposed to those settlements, particularly out there in the West Bank where there is uh, there a military drain on Israel and a financial drain. So yes, I think we should push against the settlements, but I would not uh, allow that to be, I, I, that would not lead me to cut off the aid. And I do believe um, that, uh, more of the problem has been on the Arab side, both under Ehud Barak and under Ehud Olmert. I believe Israel offered with American support deals to the Palestinians that were very good deals that would have ended the settlements and in fact led to the expulsion of some of the settlers and they rejected them. And I think, that, yes, there were problems with Israel and the settlers, in part because of Israel's political situation, but there is still, I think, uh, given the role of Hamas and in Gaza, a, uh, a real problem with there not yet being a willingness to accept Israel's existence. And I include with that even Fatah because they have said, well, they will not accept Israel as a Jewish democratic state, um, apparently because there is in the part of some of the Arabs an objection to there being a theocratic state, which apparently does not exist. It does not extend to Saudi Arabia. Right here. Chuksaswagu, um, Mason Fellow, Mid-Career MPA, Class of 2012. Um, yeah, a couple of days back, the International Atomic Energy Agency announced that a nuclear Iran is fast approaching. Israel also announced that if the U.S. doesn't take action, that they will strike Iran. Given that you just talked about cutting defense spending and given the vol volatile nature of this issue, I was wondering if, you were, if we were advising President Obama today, what action would you advise him to take on this issue? Well, I want to, the frustration here is 
and it really goes to the irresponsibility, both with Iran and North Korea, of China and Russia. Part of the reason we have not been more effective in trying to restrain the nuclearization of both countries, which are both trying to get nuclear weapons, is that neither China nor Russia will fully support that. I do not understand that. I must tell you, if I were Russia, I would be more worried about the Iranians having nuclear weapons than I am. They can wind up in, with the Chechen irredentists or others. And similarly, if I was China, I would worry about that nutcase in North Korea having a water gun, much less a nuclear weapon, uh, <laughs> right on my own border. So um, that's a frustration. We should continue to do what we can with sanctions. But I believe in both cases, the ultimate sanction, and I assume this is being delivered. My understanding is if nuclear weapons go off, you can probably identify where they came from, et cetera. I think both the North Koreans and the Iranians, I hope, are being told, God help you if one of your nuclear weapons goes off somewhere, and uh, you will pay a very, very high, high price for it. I, I, I don't think anything short of that works. I mean, I, particularly in the case of Iran, trying to take out the nuclear weapons, at this point, they're dispersed, they're hidden. Um, uh, by the way, we did obviously try to screw them up with, what is it, Stuxnet or whatever, and that was, you know, America's uh, uh, computer virus. But that's what I would do, is to try and do as much as we can economically. I think at the same time, look, you have to tell both North Korea and Iran that if they abandon nuclear weapons, there's some benefits. It cannot be all threats. They have to be credible promises, because that would be a real benefit to us um, and to the world. But the ultimate uh, lever there, I think, is the threat of very serious destruction if they do this, which would be something I would hate to do, but I think you have to make that threat. I'm going to come back to you for the last question in just a moment, but I want to take the prerogative to ask one of my own, which is just, you mentioned that, that women's weapons projects, once they exist, never get taken away and so forth. But one of the big reasons for that, many people claim, is the Congress, that yes. members in their districts are trying to protect it and so forth. Uh, the military, even the Defense Department says, if they didn't have to worry about the requirements of the Congress, they could cut a lot of spending uh, that they think is unnecessary. So how would you solve that problem uh, so that we use the money that we do spend? No, there's no Why? question. By, by making it clear, and that's why I have not been the more successful in the past. Although we have killed some, the MX missile. Um, uh, we did manage to get a majority to kill the second engine for the F-35. But the only way it can be done is compared to what? There is very little chance of defeating a weapon system in general. That's why Mike Brower's invocation of the Eisenhower warning is relevant. But we will not be voting on whether or not to kill a weapon system. We will be voting on whether or not to kill a weapon system or make you wait two more years to get on Medicare or cut Medicaid. That is, it's the zero-sum game, and I, uh, that's why I'm working very hard to frame it that way. And I believe if Congress has to vote next year on amending the sequester and exempting the military so that a greater burden f falls on Medicare, that we will win. So that's the way to do it. It is, something's going to go. I mean, can I persuade people that they should uh, chop off a finger? No. But if I said, all right, look, if you don't chop off your finger, we're chopping off your arm, I think the, uh, I think the finger will win. <laughs> Last question. Hi, Congressman. My name's Joe, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School and also one of your uh, former constituents. And I'm just curious, it came out today that China may have been sneaking counterfeit equipment into a military arsenal. And also, a few weeks ago, the Obama administration said that China and Russia have been conducting massive espionage, espionage operations against U.S. industry. And uh, last year, uh, a group of Russian spies, one of whom went to the Kennedy School, was rounded up by the FBI. And I'm curious, in light of this, uh, do you still not see China and Russia as strategic threats? First of all, you, you said they were slipping weapons to whom? It uh, just came out today. I saw it on CNN. Yeah, I don't know how to whom you said they were slipping. Oh, uh, China had been sneaking uh, technology into the U.S. Uh, military arsenal somehow. Slipping bad technology? Yeah, like like counterfeit uh, computer oh, chips okay. and stuff. Yeah, like no. Do I think that Russia and China would like to do bad things? Sure, but that doesn't mean you need a thermonuclear arsenal. I didn't say they weren't a threat. I do not think either one of them is a threat of the magnitude of what the Soviet Union was, and I want to maintain a superiority over them. Um, uh, by the way, as to espionage, that they're spying on us, guess who spies on them? <laughs> Countries spy on each other. What do you think the CIA is, a tourism bureau? <laughs> I mean, you know, these things happen. Uh, no, I look, I do not have a high regard for either the Soviet Union, for Russia or China, and we need to be on guard. The point is that at $450 billion a year, 
our military would not just be superior to Russia and China, but it would be increasing by more than they are increasing every year. That superiority would grow every year. So it's not a case of thinking that they don't have to worry about them. I want to leave the Seventh Fleet in, in there, and I don't. And I think Taiwan is a great democratic uh, success, and I would not. I would say no to China. If you invade Taiwan, we will be there. But there's no reason other Marines on Okinawa. It's one thing to say we will be there in, in Taiwan. So it's not a case of either or. It's a case of being sensible, and I think we could be a lot more sensible. Thank you. Congressman Frank, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe evening.